So this weekend was the Inosanto Fong Legends Camp in Calgary, Alberta. And I wanted to say a little bit about my impressions of the seminar, what I experienced and what I thought about it. I can tell you straight away that I was really excited for this camp. Uh, probably anyone that's been around me the last few weeks or been following my YouTube stuff or Facebook stuff has noticed me dropping these lines every once in a while about how this camp is coming up. I was really looking forward to it. I think I've probably wanted to do training with Don Inosanto since I was about 12 years old. Um, he was one of the teachers of my first Kung Fu Sifu. And so for me, it's almost like training with the with the seagung of my original school and it was just something that I've always wanted to do but I've never had the opportunity uh, because he's never done one of these seminars or anything anywhere near where I lived and I never had the means or at least never made it a, a huge priority to run down to Los Angeles to enroll in the school or something like that make that kind of a sacrifice but this is the first time that he's actually done uh, a training seminar in the area where I was living. And he's now like 78 years old. And so this was really, for me, this was like the opportunity of a lifetime to even uh, just have a couple of days training with this legend, with this living, living uh, legend. And so I was really looking forward to it. Um, I, I want to just kind of break down first how the days went uh, before I get into like my my more specific impressions. Um, but just kind of the schedule of of the day. Well, for me, um, <clears throat> the first day this is a two day event. It was a Saturday Sunday. It was all day, both days, eight hours of training with a one-hour lunch break. And for me, the first day started very early because uh, Calgary, even though it's relatively close to me, it's still a, quite a drive. So I had to wake up at 3.30 a.m. Friday night and kind of pull my things together and got out of the house by 4.30, hit the road, and made it to the camp maybe 20 minutes before eight um, to get, we had, we had some waivers and stuff to sign. And so you had to sign in and go through this processing and all of this kind of thing and get ready to train. Um, the facility where it was held was a warehouse um, near the airport that had been converted into an MMA gym and so about half of the warehouse was matted floors and walls um, with some training gear like there was some uh, Muay Thai bags and um, these kind of things and then the other half of the warehouse was uh, an octagon uh, a full-size ring and so there was about 80 people, um, I think, the first day, something around around 80 people, and probably close to that the second day, a little bit less the second day, but it's quite a few people, so we filled that space. You know, we used both the padded um, floor area and the cage, and uh, basically we started off... Um, training with with Dan and we the schedule went uh, we, we began with with JKD training or basically his his curriculum that from the Inosano Academy or parts of his curriculum of his JKD curriculum we worked on for probably a couple hours first couple of hours on on, on the Saturday and then we went into uh, Cali training for a couple hours until the lunch break. And we came back from lunch. 
we did Muay Thai for maybe an hour and a half. Um, and then um, Sifu Francis Fong took over for the last little, you know, maybe two and a half hours of the day and led us through um, some Wing Chun training. And then, and then for me, I was lucky. Um, I was able to stay at an in-law's house that night after the first day of training. And um, so I didn't have to pay for a hotel or anything. Uh, one of my wife's cousins lives in Calgary, and he, he put me up in a bed for the night. And I got a good sleep. And so the next day I started even more energized uh, for day two, and we began with a um, couple of hours of Jun Fan uh, Kung Fu. And then we did a bit of Silat training. And then we did some Kali and uh, then took lunch, came back and did Muay Thai again, and then into uh, Win Chung. Something like that. And so that was kind of how the scheduling went. Um, the way that the instruction was broken down, at least for, for Dan's segments, the way that he would do it was he would show us a drill um, and then he would show an, a, another related drill and a third related drill and a fourth and it might be a, a kind of a progression and it might or it might just be a drill that's very similar that has one or two different techniques but he'd usually show us like a series of four drills and then he'd talk for a little while about something related to those drills. Um, a he covered a lot of martial arts history that he knows. Uh, he told a lot of stories about, you know, his time in the in the martial arts. He told stories about Bruce Lee, of course. Um, told stories about all of his, you know, Cali te Cali teachers and all of these kind of things. Um, just a lot of, of history. And then he would, when he was done talking, maybe five minutes later, he would run through the four drills again just to show them. And then he'd set us to work uh, doing the drills. And we'd do it in three-minute intervals. So um, one person would, it was a lot of the work was with pads, with either tie pads or with um, with uh, focus mitts and so one person would hold the mitts for three minutes and then we'd switch over and the other person would hold the mitts and while we were working on the on the drills um, Dan would play the drums he had brought a snare drum and a tom drum and and uh, he would play the drums he would play some some music and uh, he told us the reason that he, he does the drums is because he notices that when he doesn't play the drums, people are a little bit more lazy. They don't train as hard. And so there's something about the drums that goes with the martial arts. Um, it did seem like, you know, sometimes he just didn't want to play the drums or he was tired of playing the drums. And so he, he also had a stereo that he brought with him and he'd play some music. He had a bunch of things that he brought with him that he hauled up to Canada. Um, you know, a stereo, the drums, and then he had like, he had uh, like these scrapbooks of photographs and stuff um, of, you know, to show us different things from different um, areas and styles and histories of the martial arts. And uh, he also brought a variety of weapons, what he could get away with bringing into Canada, he brought in um, to show us uh, how certain things are done um, using different weapons, especially with the Kali system. But yeah, that was kind of how it went. So for, for me, it seemed like the training was, it was a lot of it was very mental because he was expecting us to kind of uh, quickly memorize four 
drills or sequences of drills and some of them were a little bit complex you know he started he'd always start very simple but before long it would it would feel like it was getting complex I mean he would he would go through and he'd say okay I'm gonna do it slow and he'd do the, the drill very what we thought was very fast and you know people in the audience in the, you know the, they were training would would kind of chuckle at him calling it you know slow because it seemed to go very fast and we're trying to catch it sometimes you only catch you know two or three of the four drills and uh, are looking around and for help from other people is a is a lot of mental training but he seemed to know you know in terms of his pedagogy he seemed to know what he was doing as a, as a teacher uh, in the manner that he would first demonstrate the drills maybe go through them a couple of times and then talk for a little while and that right there puts a kind of a challenge to your mind because while he's talking while he's telling you know stories and sharing history of the martial arts you're also at the same time as listening to him trying to keep those drills in your head that he just showed because eventually you're gonna have to do them and then he's done talking and he goes he, he runs through the drills once more which is kind of a reinforced you know every time you every time you get knowledge given to you again you have more chance of retaining it so he must know that there's a certain amount of time between the first introduction and then give it so many minutes and do another introduction another you know reintroduce the same thing and then set somebody to work actually doing it <coughs> and maybe they'll maybe they'll retain it um, for me about the time we were maybe a third of the way into day one I realized I'm not gonna retain this this stuff um, it's just so much material um, I'm not I'm not gonna retain the actual drills you know drill by drill and we weren't allowed to like record and we weren't allowed to um, you know audio record or video record or take photographs or anything like that so the only you know device we had to record with was our bodies um, most of the things that that we drilled in were already familiar to me I mean that the techniques used were nothing new that I haven't used myself before and um, a, a lot of the drills he went through you can probably find on YouTube um, looking up some of the Insanto training videos and these kind of things you can you can probably find a lot of the stuff that we worked on or at least something very similar to what we worked on and um, ha being familiar with that kind of material already uh, what it allowed me to do about a third of the way of through day one when I realized I'm not gonna you know be able to retain all of this stuff was just to relax and not try to retain it just to relax and enjoy um, being there and being engaged in this activity with Dan and Osanto um, it didn't really matter to me at that point what I took away in terms of um, skill or anything like that I mean this is just a seminar so you're not really meant I don't think to to come away with a great body of new techniques or anything like that um, but you can enjoy the training you can get motivation from it um, you know you can learn the principles of it uh, there was there were things that he showed uh, or talked about uh, for instance with between the between the um, the Junfan Gang Fu and the JKD where he would show us a drill that was Junfan Gang Fu and then he would show it how you do the same drill with JKD and what the difference was and the difference was it was basically a, a, in the JKD form it was more of a, a counter um, 
aggressive movement. So in the JKD form, the trainer, you would say, would be the one to first attack, and then the drill would launch off of that attack. Um, in the Junfan side, it might be the actual you know trainee who's just launching the full attack. Uh, it's not a response to anything. So there were these kind of things. There were the, the kind of principles that he was introducing us to. And um, he did, you know, mention that he gets a lot of criticism um, with the JKD because people seem to be under, under the impression that, you know, it's being promoted as a style when it was never a style and this kind of a thing. Um, but from what he talked about, you know, his, his understanding of the JKD is that it's a, um, what did he call it exactly? Not counter, uh, counter aggression, but something to that effect, you know, basically you're being, you're being attacked. And so you need to be able to attack back. And depending on what you're being attacked with, you need to know the tools that are attacking you. So if a, if a Western boxer is attacking you, you better know something about boxing in order to defend yourself against him. If, um, if a jiu-jitsu practitioner is attacking you, you better know something about jiu-jitsu in order to be able to effectively um, defend yourself. All these kinds of things. So the, the JKD person needs to explore all of these different fighting arts in order to be prepared to um, to intercept whatever the attack is and understand it and know what to do about it. Um, and so he kind of framed it as as this um, counter attack system but also as this open exploration this very personal exploration of all different you know fighting arts and um, you know it was it wasn't anything that nobody's never ever heard before but you know it was just kind of cool to to hear it firsthand from him um, that kind of discussion and uh, so you take away those principles uh, the one or the, the few things that I really did get from Dan that were new to me were, were some of the Salat drills because I never have trained it all in Salat so I know nothing about it and um, so that stuff was all new for me and I found that <clears throat> throughout the seminar whenever there was something that was very new to me um, that would be something that that stuck um, and that I've retained in, in my memory a little bit better. So there's like a there's like a real um, classic 15 point Muay Thai drill that he showed us on, on the second day. Um, that I retained. Uh, I retained uh, a couple of the the C lot drills that he showed us because they were so new. Um, I'm sure I've retained part of the Cali stuff because I haven't worked that much with sticks. Um, yeah, in fact, I know there's some of the, some of the Cali stuff I've, I've retained. Um, I also retain quite a bit from the Wing Chun sessions with, uh, Sifu Francis Fong. And I never knew anything about this Francis Fong going into this camp. Um, you know, I, I heard kind of the, the rumor is that he was one of the better Win Chun guys in North America, uh, if not, you know, one of, or the best perhaps Win Chun guy in North America. I don't know. I don't like to think about who's better than who and this kind of a thing, but, um, but I was pleasantly surprised by him and uh, by what he offered uh, in in the camp. Um, he had s such excellent humor. It was a fun time when he was teaching. 
he was smiling, he was joking, and um, and he was very fast, fast paced, um, bringing us through some different teachings. And again, um, the, some of the best things to get from him were just really classic Wing Chun principles. Um, but his Wing Chun is also really different. It's almost like a a means of closing the gap to get in to deliver some really devastating um, haymaker type punches or knockouts or um, submissions. <coughs> like, <clears throat> like we we spent a good part of the day two at least in with our Wen Chun training in ground fighting. <laughs> And <clears throat> there was a point where I kind of like I was looking at it and said, "Wow, this is a very different kind of Wing Chun, right? Because we're suddenly we're doing arm bars and chokes and all these kind of things." And uh, but it was really uh, he what he pointed out is that you know some people are going to criticize this as not Wing Chun, but this is where we're incorporating lessons from Bruce Lee. Um, which is that, you know, not to, li not to limit yourself. And so, um, his Wing Chun is really quite unique, um, in the, in the manner that it brings someone, you know, straight in to the inside to a position where they can affect a, a knockout rather easily or a submission. And uh, so I did learn some things from from uh, Francis Fong that I remembered uh, for sure. And um, so I'm hoping to record some of the actual drills that I've recalled from this from this training, so that you know I just have kind of a video record of my own uh, of the of the few things that I'm going to take away and be able to say in the future that you know. Dan and Asanto, I learned this from Dan and Asanto. It might just be something very, you know, very basic. Um, but at least I can say, you know, I learned this from Dan and Asanto. Or I can say I learned this from Francis Fong. I think most of what they were delivering in the seminar was really um, basic material from the respective arts that they covered. I mean, n none of this stuff was incredibly complex or anything like that um, they covered a lot of material but it was all material that was geared to for the abilities of everyone in the room and we had you know 80 people that were age maybe maybe 13 to 14 up to 70 years old training I think the majority of people in there were probably age uh, either 20 to 30 or 30 to 40 in there those are the two biggest groups and then and then probably my group of the 40 to 50 year olds then it got pretty slim to 50 to 60 and I don't know if there was as many 60 to 70 years old as there were kids under 18 I'm not sure there was there was only a handful of each of those but uh, because there was such a wide range of people training, um, I think they chose material that was, you know, fairly basic, and everybody would be able to to do it. I had a broken hand the whole time, and I thought I wasn't going to be able to do a whole lot, uh, but surprisingly, I was able to do pretty much everything in the workshop, even with a even with a broken hand. So. Um, you know, if you're ever wondering, if, if one of these Inosano camps comes around, you're ever wondering whether or not, you know, you can do it, you can do it. Um, anybody can do it. It's a, it would it'd be a good experience for anybody of any ability to join in. Um, so, yeah, what I, what I took away in terms of the actual skills and, and lessons and such were some of the core principles, uh, both of what what Dan was teaching and what Francis Fong was teaching. 
um, some of the principles that they shared, uh, maybe a couple of trivial things uh, about historical things or trivia about Bruce that Dan shared. I uh, took away a few drills um, from each of these men. Um, but the main thing for me, the main benefit that I got from it is that for me, I walk away, I went away feeling like my batteries had just been recharged to full and that I didn't even know it before, but I hadn't been operating on full batteries for maybe a long time. You know, maybe, maybe for the last who knows how long, I've been operating at 50 or 60 percent battery when I thought, you know, that was like my full and then it didn't take long for me to get into the the 30 20 percent um, battery life left where I was feeling pretty negative and you know little things that shouldn't bother me were bothering me and this kind of a thing <clears throat> well coming out of this seminar out of this two days it was a real kind of re renewal for me I just felt like a lot of tension and a lot of weight and things that didn't matter were lifted from me and that um, I was just given uh, a really good amount of fresh energy an amount that I haven't had for a while so like really what the analogy that came to mind immediately for me was that I had just been you know recharged to a hundred percent for the first time in a while, it's been a it's been a while since I felt like I've been recharged to 100%, and so that was the biggest gain for me. I mean, I don't really care that much about um, taking away certain skills or or you know particular techniques or this kind of a thing, but just to be kind of refreshed by the experience. Uh, have that feeling of renewal. I think that's more important, and that's that's what I took away that I thought was just fantastic. It was hard to say where it was going to go day one because a lot of, some of the some of the thing was the place that it took place that it occurred in, you know, this warehouse that was set up for the MMA training. Every place that a person trains, I feel like that place has a certain kind of energy to it. And an MMA gym like this, with an octagon and all of that stuff, has a certain kind of energy. And it's an energy that I'm not so used to. Um, so it just took a little bit of kind of like settling into that place. At the same time, though, um, Dan Inosanto has a certain energy that he brings to that place. I mean, his drums brought... a incredible energy you know to that place and just the way he carries himself um, and certainly uh, Francis Fong's good humor um, and the energy that he brings uh, both of them I mean they just have they, they have really good energy such that it overpowered um, whatever the purpose of the of the setup of that gym was to create um, what they had to give us and to uh, in, in my case at least to to kind of refresh and renew me um, in a way that I just needed to be refreshed it was exactly what I needed is uh, what they gave me which was you know the sense that all of that stuff that I've been like bothering me and everything none of it really mattered <laughs> it's not important and uh, and you know I just went away feeling just amazing from the experience today because I was you know tired out I'm on kind of the down down the hill side of things um, because I had to wake up again early again this morning and get to a meeting, you know, before even the dawn and <clears throat> and then uh, do a full day's work and then come home and do some more training and, 
you know, now I'm trying to catch up with stuff on my um, email and YouTube and this kind of a thing. And so I'm pretty worn out today, but I still feel like the energy that I that I took away from that place. And I think tomorrow I'll feel it even better because I won't have such a rush day tomorrow. Um, but, you know, in general, I just walked away feeling fantastic. So um, I don't know what others get from the camps, uh, from the Innocento camps and such. I mean, if there was a, another one in the future, I would go. And in fact, if there was another seminar with other um, invited martial artists uh, that are well known I would go I just I felt like it was a good experience the seminar education you're getting a lot of material delivered to you really fast so fast it's hard to know what you're going to retain and what what you're not like what I experienced was the new stuff the things that were um, the techniques that were new to me um, were easier for me to like retain. That was where my mind uh, went to work and actually grabbed it, grabbed hold of it, and kept it. Um, the other thing, the other drills and stuff that we did, the stuff that was already familiar to me, um, my mind didn't retain it because it probably because I know that I can create whatever drills I want using those same kind of techniques. I don't necessarily have to take the exact drills that were that were given in the workshop. And um, I don't know, that was I, that's part of the lesson of the workshop, I think, uh, of, of this particular workshop anyway, is that you can you can um, you can explore and it's a good thing to to do so. So I enjoyed it. I would recommend the experience to um, to anyone, and I know that you know a lot of people have already had this experience. A lot of people have gone to Inosanto camps, um, and but in any case, you know, I would recommend it. it gets I, it gets my thumbs up for sure. <laughs> And I was surprised what I actually got out of it. You know, when I went in, I thought I'm going to focus on, you know, learning a few techniques and this kind of thing. I knew it was going to be overwhelming, but I figured I'd focus on learning, <clears throat> on taking away, you know, a few, a couple of two, three things a day, two, three things that I can take and add to my martial arts. I got that, I got that couple of two, three things for sure. Um, but that wasn't the important thing. What ended up being the important thing is the is the good charge, the good energy that these guys brought um, and shared with us and helped us uh, walk away with. So for that, I, I'm very grateful to them, and uh, it was a good experience. Um, I would definitely recommend it to anyone who's thinking. Should I go to the, should I should I pay the money to go to the San Santo camp? Yes, you should. It's a it's a good thing. It'll help you one way or another. It'll help you. So that was um that was the Legends camp.